Our next guest and, and uh, speaker, ladies and gentlemen, is Michael Rouse from Australia. He'll be talking about building collaboration, major capital project management. Thank you. And thanks for getting Mike. The magic clicker works perfectly. Um, thank you very much. It's quite a privilege to be here. I am one of those uh, other Australians. Um, we um, today I want to talk to you about not so much about the. I, I may get the award as the most self-serving presentation for the day. An external advisor telling you how good external advisors are. We. Um, this is about getting into the execution phase of where you're at and where our big capital programs. So many of you will say, you know, Deloitte, you're big on numbers and that's very true. We actually have a global capital projects group, which I lead for Energy National Resources. I lead it for all of Australia and New Zealand. Because these are very big numbers that you're dealing with. So how do we go and deal with a $40 billion number? How do we do it successfully, safely? And then how do we take advantage of getting the best of everything in the world coming here into Christchurch? So I do love this slide. Apparently that's hell. If you're an Aussie, my hell was last night watching Carlton get done by Richmond. It was agony. So, um, but hell is paved with those, with those good intentions. There is no one in this entire city, there's no one here in this room who doesn't have good intentions. But we don't always achieve the right outcome. And so my Capital Projects Group is about trying to get you to that outcome, trying to get you to be very self-aware about what success looks like, being self-aware about who's done it before, who hasn't, and what's worked and what hasn't. And so that may be the hell. And then this is the most ironic road on the planet. So I spent eight years working in China. I worked on the Beijing Olympics for many years. And I have been to this road, and it's amazing. It is the, it's called the road to heaven. It's the most wonderful analogy ever. It is the most dangerous road on the planet. It is, it is an absolute nightmare. And this is where most major projects get to at this point. You are definitely at the bottom of that road. So having looked at over the past few visits here, this is the beginning of the journey, not the end. It's a great relief to be talking about plans and building and seeing a lot of the demolition having been completed, but we're all at the bottom. And that road up is extremely dangerous. And it's dangerous primarily for one thing in our experience, is that, and a perfect um, answer to the question, what Mike is doing with the panelisation of this housing is, is outstanding and very logical, but it is completely new. And so if you're an Australian who's been, you know, working with these natural resources companies spending in the 20s, 40s, 60 billion dollars, everybody thinks that we are incredibly special and incredibly unique, but we're not. There are many, many 20, 30 billion dollar programs happening at once. But what we do unfortunately do is we take exactly the same processes to every single one. And so in a lot of major project execution, the the right process, as we define it, with the wrong outcome is totally acceptable. A new process with the right outcome is perceived as risky, and risky equals bad in our capital project execution. So the big part of today is about how do we bring some of the skills, techniques, capabilities, experience, so that people don't perceive new as risky. People perceive new as needed, because otherwise we're going to go with the same old processes we're going to get exactly the same outcomes that we get on all our capital projects. Before I tell you what that inevitable outcome is, this is great. Go on, so there's homework from today. Go and um, find out who Tali Sharo is. She is awesome. She's a uh, psychologist that's done a lot of study that says basically, genetically we're optimistic. And that if we weren't optimistic, we wouldn't try new things, which means we wouldn't have started walking, we wouldn't have invented fire, we wouldn't have done all of these things. But that's very important for each of you to understand. Every one of you is genetically engineered to be optimistic. Every one of you, me included, thinks that we are special and very capable. So that when we go to work and we say, you know what, my business case doesn't quite hold up at 20% contingency, I can do it for 15, you're kidding yourselves, you can't. Because statistically you might be very special, but you can't. And so it's about understanding first that we've got these inherent things that hold us back from being successful to deliver on time and on budget. And then Bent, <coughs> if any of you don't know, Bent Flyberg is a um, professor at Oxford University. Um, 
a shocking individual to present after he's one of the greatest presenters. Bent basically put science to what we would call art, which is he's taken 4,000 capital projects around the world and put them into his magic database and taught all of us project manager types an amazingly important thing. Not very happy about it, but it's a good thing, is that the vast majority of us are going to deliver over our commitments to our clients. And when I say the vast majority of us, I really mean like the 99% of us. Project management is not about... um, being successful, it's about not being a failure. Because on time, on budget is the thing that you commit to your clients, but that's as good as you're ever gonna get. You're never really gonna come in much under a few percent under budget a few months before you're supposed to go live. And in reality, the skew of what Ben's done is way down the right. So more homework, check out what Ben's done. This is one of my more favorites, I'm not gonna hover on it very long. This is all the things that you will see written down on a piece of paper that says the stuff that will skew you getting the truth in your meetings. It might be you as an executive getting a progress report. It might be you creating the progress report. I have personally lied in all three ways, I'm sure. Unintentionally, of course, Governor. Now, this is what Bent's done. So what Bent has done in terms of turning this into something that you can get your head around and then you can execute on is Bent took this Uh, with his research team, took all the analysis of the different types of projects and created a thing called a reference class. So for every project that you do, whether it might be a sports stadium, he particularly did a lot of work around the UK subways, said that for every type of project that you do, office building, stadium, even an IT project, etc., the first thing he did was he mapped it on a scale of on time, on budget, against actual execution. First thing you have to understand, the mean execution for projects is roughly in that 20 to 30% range. Because by definition, the left-hand side of on time, on budget, so few hit that. But there are these massive black swans that we'll talk about later, which go into the 200 and 300%, which take the skew. So just acknowledge it, know it exists, know you're not special, and know that in a big portfolio of programs here in this city, you'll have a couple that really will suck. That's okay, it's gonna happen. Let's not lose a lot of sleep over it, but let's not say that it's not gonna happen. And let's make sure we put controls in place, which is the role of stuff like what we do, to try and make sure that doesn't happen. The other thing that the British government has done, so third bit of homework, busy night for you guys, is check out the government procurement controls around capital project execution out of the British government. So they actually take away the ability of an individual project to define its contingency. I was in a meeting yesterday with one of the uh, foundation programs talking about what contingency should we use. And I thought to myself, you know what? Someone solved this problem before. So if you are in the British government, you're doing a major capital project over, I think I'm gonna guess a number here, I think it's 200 million. Um, you have a mandated contingency for what you do and you've got to make your business case stand up on that mandated contingency because they took the last 20 years of execution of your similar project and said, you're not special. On average, you're going to run mm, 20, 22, 24% over your design. That's the number. Now make your business case stand up on that basis. We'll still put the same controls over how you spend your contingency. It's not a free license to spend, but it's a recognition that your project needs to be able to accommodate from a benefits perspective, you spending that much. Super cool, works a treat, and starts to put science in the way that you execute. Role of government in that is important. I mean, you could talk for hours about reference class forecasting. It's brilliant, it's very good, and it's a nice way that external people can hold that mirror up to you with the science. So don't think that this capital project execution and portfolio execution is an art, it's a science. Now, I'll talk a little bit about the art. This is one of my more favorite experiences. Okay, this is where we get to bad the Aussies. This is quite good, this would be fun. Usually I do this present, I talk to my guys in Perth or Brisbane, they're happy to bag the Melbourne people, it's a Melbourne story. So let's talk about risks, risk management. Uh, I thought there was some fantastic commentary this morning around risk management. Risk management is um, a thousand things to a thousand people. The one thing I wanted people to recognise is that we take a very scientific view to risk management. We calculate in its uh, base form 
What's the chance of a risk? What's the impact? Therefore, I get some sort of weighted things I need to worry about and mitigate. One of the things we find around capital projects particularly is that there are some particular outcomes which are not likely, but which are very, very uncool and very, very bad. But we tend to ignore them because they're not very likely. And of course, it's a, the, excuse the irony of obviously the earthquake event is one of those. But in reality, as we get into execution mode, as we start to build things and we build systems and we get into this, there has to be an element that we've got to understand that these very large, but highly unlikely risks have to be managed properly. And once again, it's the external advisors who are going to see those that you won't. And this is, my, this is probably my favourite ever capital project story. So I'm a Melbourne boy, lived most of my life overseas, building big things and holes in the ground. But in my absence, the Victorian government, through a drought, decided, oh, you know what, let's spend $5 billion on a desalination plant so that we've got water. And it was really bad. It was like, you know, the, the drought went on for many, many years. Well, I'm not sure if at any point in that process someone said, you know what, there's a non-zero chance that we're going to spend $5 billion, don't forget this is over the, this is just post-GFC, and that we never turn it on. First of all, they said it's going to be four, and then it was five, and it's never been turned on, ever. So Google it if you want to and say, Rouse, you must be lying your ass off. No, it's true. Five billion dollars. This is with thousands of advisors and thousands of people and all the very good reasons to do it. So getting back to that road, it's not the usual path that will always get you to the place you need to get to. It's about being insightful. It's about understanding what new processes we need to put in place. It's about understanding what are the key things we need to do. And particularly around risk management, don't ever think that we're better than we really are. Statistically, we're all average by definition. Okay, so, and this, this is where we get to some of the um, interesting science around how we execute projects and the role of having people around that can provide that different lens on what you're looking at. And this is basically a breakdown. One of the things that we've experienced, um, we knew existed, so this is around the coal seam gas um, activity in northern Queensland. So the coal seam gas um, Seemed like it is, and it is a brilliant idea. Economic, it's a fantastic um, opportunity for Australia to get cleaner energy. One of the few things people know is that the US, for the first time in history in the last year, actually achieved their greenhouse gas emission target primarily because of all the cheap shale gas out of um, uh, southern US. So it is fantastic for the environment to translate all your coal fired power stations into your gas fired power stations. But in the meantime, there's a lot of issues around water contamination, groundwater, etc., which is this top left organisation called GetUp, who are very, very sophisticated, very capable. So who would have thought you could spend $24 billion and be utterly dependent upon a half a dozen people when it started um, with issues around coal seam gas and water contamination? Uh, legitimate issues, by the way. These are not illegitimate. They're well-informed people. They're educated people. So it's about understanding where your risks lie, it's about measuring it, and then it's about managing it in a way that is open-minded and in a way that is <coughs> being very self-aware. So for the first number of years around coal seam gas, we were very unaware that this was a potential very big risk for us because if we can't drill, we can't get the gas. If we can't get the gas, we don't make the money. And then I'm going to leave you with a final element around capital project execution that is um, my favourite bugbear of the day, which is that we, well, I get asked to do a lot of project reviews. I get, we have um, probably two or 300 people working on projects around these capital projects around the world at any time. And for the vast majority, we tend to record progress pretty much the same. So we have a little Microsoft PowerPoint for those big jobs we have, you know, Primavera and all these complicated tools. One of the things we do is we have this percentage complete, my personal favourite. So we've got 10 tasks in a row and all of them are half finished. And so we'll call that 50% complete. And we go, oh, we're halfway there. Well, actually, 10 half finished tasks is zero. 
outcome. You've earned no value. You haven't done anything. And so this is a sophisticated way, but an obvious way. It's how you would sit and have a coffee with someone saying, how are you going? Well, yeah, we're busy, but you know, I haven't, your house, if your house is getting built and they're, you know, halfway through everything, you're like, yeah, but I'm not, I don't have anything yet. I can't move in. I can't do anything. So these all very common sense things, you say, oh, that sounds quite sensible. They are rarely done in major project execution because everyone's very afraid with the big numbers that we're dealing with. What am I going to do? I'm going to have a highly skilled, very detailed plan of things. It's going to be waterfall. I'm going to stick to my guns and off I go. And the reality is much more complex than that. The portfolio nature of what's going to occur here in Christchurch, you know, we heard earlier around the need to coordinate. It's very, very difficult. Engineers like me, project managers, structural engineers, we have very one-dimensional almost no EQ at all. We're incapable of being able to work with others. And that's the singular thing you need to be super successful. So as we go forward, as, you go, as we go plowing through this over the next number of years, that path, this magic road to the top, don't take the standard way. The standard way will cost you a lot of money and it will be painful. Understand the deviations you need to take. Understand the things that feel right for you here in this environment. Understand that you do need to work together and then embed that into new and, and effective ways of working. So thank you very much.